<laughs> Hello everyone, thank you all for coming to today. Um, my name is Veronica Stidvent. I'm the director of the Center for Politics and Governance here at the LBJ School. And I want to thank you all for coming to the latest installment of our author series uh, on this very Super Tuesday, the busiest primary day in the United States ever. And uh, so we're very thrilled today to have Garrett Graff, author of the first campaign, who's here to talk about uh, his latest book and to talk more to us about politics, the internet, and uh, everything that's going on in Washington. Garrett Graff is editor-at-large at the Washingtonian Magazine, where he edits uh, the Capital Comment section and covers media and politics. The founding editor of Fishbowl DC, a blog that covers media and journalism in Washington, he was the first blogger admitted to cover a White House press briefing. A Vermont native, he also served as a Deputy National Press Secretary on Howard Dean's presidential campaign, and beginning in 1997 was then Governor Dean's first webmaster. He teaches journalism and new media at Georgetown University, and so we are so very pleased today to welcome Garrett Graff uh, and to discuss his book, The First Campaign. Thank you. So, thank you all for coming. Um, although I also remember as a college student the lure that free food would offer to show up to hear a speaker. Um, I'm very excited to be here uh, at the LBJ School and to be here um, especially today, um, w which uh, in at least one of the races looks like it will be the decisive day for the presidential uh, nominating contests. Um, although it looks like the, the Democratic race will probably go on uh, for another couple of days, if not uh, another couple of months uh, after today. Um, the first campaign is, is my uh, attempt to try to think about and place into some context the way that technology and globalization are reshaping the, the political landscape. This is a subject that um, I've spent a lot of time working on in, in, in my uh, relatively brief career in, in politics and, and journalism. Um, but in terms of this presidential race, I started thinking about it in the fall of 2005 when I was working uh, on a, a, a piece for a Washingtonian about Mark Warner, who was then the, the governor of Virginia and was preparing to leave, uh, he was term limited out of the governor's mansion in Virginia and going to head off to, to run for president, a decision that he ended up sort of not really doing uh, a year later, uh, despite having basically run for president for a year up until that point. But what Warner was talking about when he was out on the trail was the idea that we, that, that politics hasn't really caught up with where our culture and our society is today. That we have had these tremendous changes undergo uh, in the American economy, in American society, in American culture over the last five, 10, 15, 20 years, and that politics really hasn't caught up with that. It hasn't really figured out how to deal with uh, sort of governing a, a flat world and what role the American economy should have in, in a globally competitive environment with China and India and Africa um, in terms of energy, in terms of education, in terms of tech infrastructure. Um, I had a, a piece earlier this week talking um, about how, you know, 150 years ago the United States uh, saw the need for a transcontinental railroad system to unite and, and further the growth of the United States. Um, 50 years ago, Dwight Eisenhower saw the need for an interstate highway system that would sort of facilitate and grow interstate commerce. We've seen governmental efforts to, to emphasize rural electrification, telephone, uh, and that we haven't really yet seen anything in the way of a broad, thoughtful government initiative for the information age. Uh, wireless technology, broadband technology, the United States is light years behind a lot of where other, a lot of uh, other industrialized uh, and developing economies are. And that these are all sort of really huge issues that have been largely pushed to the side for the last eight years as we have dealt with the fallout from 9-11 and from the, the Iraq war and the, and the war in Afghanistan. And that for the next president, the, the questions of how the United States grapples with these issues of technology and globalization 
is really going to be the forefront of a lot of the issues that we want to talk about. Take health care. Well, 1994, when Hillary Clinton and, and Bill Clinton sort of started to push on, on their health care, um, the United States, uh, the, the, they really ran into a lot of opposition from, from American business who didn't want to see uh, this, this sort of government come in and take over health care. Fast forward to 2008, and what we've seen is that the evolution of globalization and, and the global economy has meant that the United States is now the only major industrialized country in the world that puts the price of health care in the price of the product. And so what that means is if you are General Motors and you're building cars, $1,200 of the purchase price of your automobile, every automobile sold by GM anywhere in the world, goes to cover the cost of health care for its U.S. workers. The, the comparable cost, that actually, mind you, is more than the cost of the steel that goes into a GM automobile. The cost for, for a Japanese or a Korean manufacturer is in the four to $500 range. So if you are GM looking to compete in, in a growing market like India or China uh, or, or even here in the United States where uh, by roughly 3,000 cars, uh, Toyota almost uh, took over GM as, as the largest uh, auto manufacturer last year. If you are GM, $1,000 of every car that you sell in the world goes to cover your U.S. health care prices. And that puts you at a huge competitive disadvantage to, to, to Nissan, to any of these other car manufacturers. And these are really the issues that when the next president takes office, they're going to see that it's American business that is really pushing for these reforms in health care, in terms of education, where they don't see students uh, coming out of US, uh, the, the U.S. education system at the level that they need to be to compete in, in this global market. Um, the level of tech infrastructure, where um, I, when I was in India last year doing reporting for this book, I had better cell phone reception in, uh, in rural India in these shack villages of you know, cardboard and corrugated uh, tin than I did um, in, you know, for instance, the subway system of New York City. Um, and then you know, look at energy and the environment and the way that we have these huge energy and environmental issues that we need to deal with both here at home in terms of oil and, and renewable energy, but also that all of the stuff that we are doing here in the United States pales in comparison to the fact that China is bringing on a new coal-fired power plant online every single week for somewhere between the next 20 and 30 years. Like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of coal-fired power plants. And that that is going to undo all of the compact fluorescent light bulbs, all of the Toyota Priuses, all of the recycled white paper, and all of the, you know, um, the, the good work that we're, we're trying to do sort of on a, on a local grassroots level here in the United States. And so the next president is really going to need to think about these issues in a much, much bigger way than we have thought about them over the last four or eight years. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about the, the other half of the book, looking at uh, the, the side of technology as a medium for this campaign and not just as a message for this campaign. Um, and then uh, open it up to some questions. So this is, uh, I think it's clear to sort of everyone involved today that we are on the cusp of a historic election, um, potentially one of the most transformative that any of us will really see in our lifetime. Um, and this is, this is true for, for a number of reasons. The first is that this is only the second time since 1920 that it's not clear who the Republican nominee for president is going to be two years before the election happens. This is the most disorganized the Republican Party has been in almost 80 years. This is also the first time since 1920 that there has not been an incumbent president or vice president in the race, except for one year, 1952, when Dwight Eisenhower, a five-star Army general who just won World War II, ran for president and was up for the nomination on both, both parties' tickets. Um, 
so this is, um, he ended up accepting, of course, the Republican nomination, but he was offered the Democratic nomination as well. So this is, uh, I mean, in terms of the, the openness and in terms of the unknownness of this election, it's, it's a really, uh, really historic moment. Um, my, my book also argues, uh, and the title comes from this idea that I think that the truly transformative moment when we look back on this election uh, in, in, in the decades to come is going to be that this is the first campaign of the, in, the information age. This is going to be the first campaign where technology is both a medium and a message to really drive home uh, the, the way that the candidates talk about and interact with these issues. To, talk, to give you some context of just how quickly the world has changed, I want to take you back to the day that the Supreme Court settled Bush v. Gore in 2000. The, the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon were almost a full year away at that point, still, still in the future. Saddam Hussein and the Taliban were still in power. Blogs and podcasts were about a year to two years old. Cell phones were still a novelty. Blackberries were also about a year old. The iPod was still almost a full year away from being invented, or at least announced. Google was in its infancy. MySpace, Facebook, YouTube were still years away. Um, in 2000, most of the country was still on a dial-up connection. Uh, we now have, uh, at the beginning of 2007, a year ago, 90% of Americans were uh, now using broadband, up from basically zero in 2000. Um, and more than one in three Americans was primarily connecting to the web wirelessly. So, I mean, th these are huge transformational technolog technological changes that have taken place in an incredibly short length of time. Um, to, to give you some sense of just how quickly the internet has arrived, uh, internet penetration in, in, in a decade from the mid-90s to the early 2000s went from 9% to 70%. To put that in a little wider perspective, it took cars 55 years to reach a quarter of the U.S. population from the moment that they were introduced commercially. It took Electricity, about 46 years to reach a quarter of the U.S. population. Took television, 26 years. Computers, just 15 years. Cell phones, 13 years. And broadband, only six. So sort of each subsequent technology that we see coming along is being adopted more quickly by a wider percentage of the population than, than the technology that came before it. Nearly about 10% of the U.S. population no longer has a landline telephone. Uh, that number, if you're under 30, like I am, that number rises to one in three. Um, I've actually never had a landline telephone since I went off to college. And that, that is now much more the norm, but has very profound implications for, for U.S. policy and U.S. governance because cell phones are not legally allowed to be called by political campaigns or pollsters. And so you have this whole population, one in three under 30s, who are being taken off of the political grid. And that's, how, that's why candidates are turning to things like Twitter, uh, things like text messaging, things like email, things like YouTube, things like Facebook, things like uh, MySpace, to reach that same set of audience because they're now much harder to reach than they were 10 or 15 years ago. <coughs> the biggest difference in talking to webmasters uh, on the various presidential campaigns this year is that in 2004, when I was on the Dean campaign, we had two websites. We had deanforamerica.com and we had blogforamerica.com. They were both campaign-owned, campaign-controlled, campaign-designed, and campaign-staffed. Now, if you, are, uh, if you are serious about the web online, you are maintaining somewhere between 30 and 50 websites. You're, you're talking about not just your own campaign, your BarackObama.com, your HillaryClinton.com, your RudyGiuliani.com. You're talking about Facebook pages, MySpace pages, YouTube pages, uh, you know, Dig pages, Twitter pages, um, and that there are all of these niche social network sites and niche communities online that you now have to be a part of, and that the, the conversation that used to take place on your site is now being 
uh, sent out to, to all of these niche communities that you still have to monitor and you still have to follow. Um, you don't really need to hear any of this stuff. Um, so to, to, th to think about, again, sort of how different this race is because of the Internet, um, go back to the fall of 2006 when the, the Republican nominee appeared to actually be very clearly defined, and it was going to be George Allen, the, the Virginia senator and wildly popular former governor. Um, he was sort of widely seen as the front runner. He was building the apparatus. He had this uh, easy coast on the way to his, his reelection in, in 2006 until he ran into this new site called YouTube, <laughs> which, again, just how quickly these things are being developed and, and adopted, YouTube at the beginning of 2006 didn't exist. It was, uh, it was in, it, it was in sort of vague public launch. It was not publicly known. It was basically this sort of fringe group uh, trying, along with about 30 other sites, to figure out a way to make online video work. By the end of uh, end of the election, of course, it uh, YouTube had. I think that there's a very good argument to be made, delivered this, the U.S. Senate to the Democrats in two key races. The first being, of course, George Allen with his Macaca moment, and the second being Conrad Burns uh, losing in, in Montana to, to John Tester. Um, John Tester's campaign had devoted a ton of resources to following him and videotaping uh, Burns at sort of every campaign stop and posting those videos. Uh, of Conrad Burns' sort of wacky antics online, including perhaps the, the two most damaging videos were one where he fell asleep in a farm hearing, farm bill hearing in Montana uh, while he was like sitting up at, at, the, at the dais. Um, and, you know, John Tester posted this video and he said, you know, I'm not going to fall asleep during a hearing <laughs> in Montana on the most important issue for, for most Montanans. The second was he had this video where he answered his cell phone in the middle of, of a rally to, to talk to the illegal immigrant who was doing yard work at his house in Virginia and sort of starts joking with the crowd about how he's not really sure this guy has a green card and that this is uh, you know, his like crazy little guy that he's got running around his, his homestead in Virginia, which of course, you know, is probably not a good joke to have anyway, but certainly a bad one if you are at the time the Republican senator sort of most leading the charge on illegal immigration. That to sort of expose this, it's not really hypocrisy uh, exactly, but sort of this... Uh, uncomfortable tension in Conrad Burns' life uh, helped to, to lead uh, John Tester to, to defeat him at the polls. And so the, the Democrats took, their, took the, the Senate in the 51-49 race, where two races were basically decided by the impact of YouTube. And, you know, I think that today, um, when at long last we may have a Republican nominee, it's particularly amusing to look back on the fact that if George Allen had not campaigned for re-election, but instead spent the last five months of the race lying on a beach in the Bahamas, he would probably be the Republican nominee for president today. But that by going out on the campaign trail and campaigning and getting caught on YouTube, George Allen's political career is, is basically finished. Um, that since 2006, of course, we've entered this much, much larger playing field of the presidential race. And to see just how much the, the presidential race has been transformed by technology, look at only at the way that each candidate chose to announce their, their, that they were going to run. John Edwards announced with a text message to his supporters' cell phones saying, check out johnedwards.com, I've got a special announcement, uh, the evening before he officially announced in, in New Orleans. 
Barack Obama, this uh, first term, little known senator from, from the state of Illinois, sent out an email to his supporters saying, click on this link, I've got a video message for you. And most people who were on his email list saw that video of him talking online, announcing that he was interested in running for president. It wasn't his announcement, it was his announcement that he was interested in running for president. Um, before they had read a single newspaper article or a single uh, media report that Barack Obama was going to, to get into the race. Fast forward a couple of days later, Hillary Clinton announces online in a, in a video that she's posting. And whether or not the candidates like it, every minute since then, people have been watching. There have been, there were bloggers on uh, John Edwards' press plane uh, when he did his announcement tour. There have been people following and recording uh, the candidates at, at, at YouTube, or on YouTube uh, throughout the campaign. And we're entering sort of what, what I call the, the Miranda era uh, of, of presidential politics, where anything you say can and will be used against you. Um, and, and probably in most cases, what is so interesting about how quickly that this is happening is that this video and these, these blogging, bloggers are getting the information online even before the candidates are finished saying it. That you can be passing around YouTube clips even before a candidate has finished a speech in, in a given location. Um, you know, just thinking back to, to 2004 and how primitive the technologies of the Dean campaign was, was using at the time, you know, it, it could have taken us it, it did take us on many occasions, almost all day, to get audio back from an event and get it cut and get it edited and get it online. Um, and now, you know, basically your run-of-the-mill cell phone can capture video and post it to YouTube uh, live from, from any event. Um, as, I, as I lay out in, in much greater depth in the book, I think that there are four tools that are really going to reshape uh, the, this presidential election and, and the next couple of, uh, of, of elections. Online video, cell phones, blogs, and social networking sites. And we're, you're going to pair those four with a fifth tool that we saw play a little bit of a role in 2004 and 2000, which is online fundraising. And that Barack Obama's campaign is competitive with Hillary Clinton today and will be competitive with Hillary Clinton tomorrow, regardless of tonight's outcome, thanks entirely to small dollar online fundraising. Barack Obama in January raised $28 million online out of $32 million total that he raised. All but about 12% of Barack Obama's money at this point is coming through small dollars online. To put that number a little bit in perspective, $28 million, roughly a million dollars a day, is more in the month of January than Howard Dean raised online in his entire presidential campaign in 2004. It's also more than twice what Hillary Clinton raised in the month of January, just in Barack's online money. And the beauty of the way that these two campaigns have built their systems is that Hillary raised a ton of money up front through very large maximum dollar donors. And that Barack Obama built this 600,000 person small dollar fundraising list. He got 170,000 new contributors in January alone. That those are people who are giving $25, $50, $100 at a time. And that every time that they get excited about Barack Obama, they can go back and donate another $25, <coughs> $50, or $100. Whereas every time Hillary Clinton needs more money, she has to go out and find new $2,000 donors that Barack Obama already has nearly 600,000 people who can contribute, for the most part, thousands of more dollars to his campaign. Whereas each time Hillary needs to raise money, she's, she's having to go out and, and find, new, uh, to find new supporters to, to create the same small dollar online fundraising base that, that Barack has created. And that I think that if Barack Obama wins the nomination, it will be solely because of his, of his online small dollar fundraising base. Um, 
Let me see if there's anything else here that I wanted to say. Otherwise, I will just open it up to questions. Um, in terms of the, the online video, you know, we've seen the, the, the YouTube debates this year, which um, I would argue were uh, a nice step forward, but far from the, sort of the, the democratic undertaking that, that a true YouTube debate uh, would be, and I'd be happy to talk about that more if, uh, if people are interested. Um, but, but again, what is so interesting about the way that online video is changing the dynamic of the presidential race this time is that it's forcing creativity back into the political process in a way that you didn't have to be creative if you were just running television ads online, if you were just running television ads on TV. That political consultants had, have gotten used to the idea that you buy set periods of time in primetime TV or evening newscasts or morning newscasts, and that people watch those ads whether or not the ads are good and whether or not the ads are persuasive, that it's just about sort of the repetition of getting out there and, and reporting uh, the ads over and over and over again. But that doesn't work online because unless something is viral, unless something is interesting and, and makes you say, huh, or inspires you, you're not going to pass it along. And that online, you don't have to be wedded to a 30 second or a one minute television spot in the way that you do um, in television. You know, if, if four years ago or eight years ago, um, someone had come up with the most brilliant two minute political commercial ever designed, there would be virtually nowhere that it could see air. Now, this week, uh, have you guys seen the Yes We Can song video? Uh, Will I Am and Jesse Dillon, Will I Am from Black Eyed Peas, and, and Jesse Dillon posted a four minute and 30 second music video where they had uh, sort of mashed up Barack Obama's New Hampshire primary victory speech with all of these celebrities from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar to John Legend to Scarlett Johansson to uh, a whole bunch of other people that I, I don't really recognize. Um, <laughs> talking about this speech sort of as Barack recites it. And they set it to music, and they do it all in this very nice, stark, uh, black and white video. Four minutes and 30 seconds is an eternity in political advertising. And it, um, it came out on Friday. Um, and uh, you know, I think it's basically half a million people a day are watching it right now, um, and it's just it's exploding in a way that I, I was just going through um, my friends' Facebook statuses, and I have four or five friends who have some version of "Yes, We Can" as their Facebook status right now, and that that's really where this campaign is going to be won or lost. And certainly, if you are Barack Obama, who is winning. Uh, with voters under 30 by 40 to 50 points in each primary. This is the demographic where you're going to win or lose this election. And that, as, as I argue, I think that this is going to be the first campaign that is really transformed by, by technology at every level. And that certainly as we get into talking more about the issues, uh, we're going to be seeing more of technology as a medium and, uh, sorry, as a message and not just as a medium uh, as we have seen it thus far. Um, but I think that it, it is certainly clear to anyone who is paying attention today that this really is the first campaign uh, of a new era. Um, and so with that, I'll open it up and uh, take questions or comments or, yeah. So I guess um, when advertising, television advertising, let's say, first started, it gave us uh, in consumer information, and that sort of moved till eventually it doesn't really give you consumer information, it just sort of gives you product awareness. Mm -hmm. And in the same sense, sort of to what extent does that apply to, say, a YouTube video? Whereas first you had, uh, you know, Conrad Burns suddenly being revealed as someone who was maybe a hypocrite, and you had the Makaka. This is giving the political consumer something closer to perfect information. Mm -hmm. Whereas a Yes We Can video doesn't give me perfect information because it is now 
you know, it's something to pull at heartstrings and to, mm-hmm. it's different. Yep. No, it, it, and the, this is where, you know, viral videos fall into sort of two categories. Either they're funny and you want to pass them along, see Miss South Carolina and the Miss America or Miss Teen America pageant, or they're educational. Um, and that there are all sorts of ways that YouTube is being used today that we haven't even yet really figured out. Um, one, of, one of the most interesting ways sort of leaving the US political race is Al-Qaeda is actually one of the most sophisticated users of YouTube and online video of anyone anywhere in the world. They have done a remarkably impressive job of posting videos of uh, bombings, of hostages, of U.S. soldiers being killed in Iraq uh, on, on YouTube and, and on similar video sharing sites both here and in, in the Islamic world. The difference being, if you go off of YouTube and you go to the Islamist sites, there's the same videos that you can get on YouTube, but right next to the videos there's a big donate here button. And so Al-Qaeda is turning to YouTube as a really easy way to do the exact same thing that Barack Obama is doing here, which is build a small dollar online fundraising base, where every time you get inspired by an Al-Qaeda bombing video on an Islamist website, you can click and give them another $25. And so what we really, you know, I think a lot of what we are seeing right now, we don't really understand the true power of, and we don't really understand the best ways to be using it. And so whether it's an inspirational video, uh, like a Yes We Can thing that you just want to pass along because it gets you fired up and it pulls at the heartstrings, or whether it's a Conrad Burns video and you want to pass it along because it's educational or because uh, it it helps sway your your view of electoral politics, that uh, that this is a medium where it, it's a fundamental shift away from the way that television has been appointment viewing uh, for for a country for the last 50 years. That we don't know, um, to, to give you a couple of numbers here and just sort of how much television is, is changing uh, to, to online video. Um, as, as it splinters, you know, the Gunsmoke in, in 1960 was the top rated uh, television show. It had a 62 share which meant that of the, all of the televisions on in the country at a given moment, 62% of them were tuned into Gunsmoke when Gunsmoke was on. Today, not a single one of the top 20 shows on, on network television would, make, would have made the, the top 20 shows from, from 1960. A good share today is in the 15 range. If you can get in the 15 to 20 range, you're doing really, really, really well, uh, with a few exceptions like the Super Bowl. And, and that that has sort of splintered, and that that is going to continue to splinter. We're at a point this year where this year will mark one out of every three households in the United States uh, will be using a TiVo or a DVR as their primary mode of watching television, meaning that they'll be skipping the ads and watching shows sort of when they want uh, on a schedule that they want. You know, iTunes is moving to become a video distributor in the way that you can rent movies online from from iTunes or from Netflix or even from Amazon. Um, And that sort of video on demand is where this is all heading. But but sort of as you're saying, we're um, we're not really sure what this means. And, we're, and the implications of this for the business model, both of television and also for political debate, are still very, very much up in the air. Yeah. Uh, following the question, what are, could you make some comments about the potential for dirty tricksters? Sure. To use YouTube. Sure. Um, just go back four years. Uh, Swift Boat Veterans for Truth was entirely a television-launched campaign. That was a television-driven uh, uh, campaign. Today, that, that looks incredibly outdated. There's no reason that you need to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to put, a, put an ad on TV if you want to share something terribly wrong. 
Um, the the thing that um, we were talking about actually over breakfast is there's a rumor online uh, that is incredibly pervasive um, and also incredibly false that Barack Obama is a Muslim and was educated in an Indonesian madrasa. Um, and that it's now so much easier to spread false information online in ways that you never could have four years ago. Or, in, in the case of, uh, you know, a, a macaca ad, spread true information uh, that's, that's just negative information um, much, much more quickly online. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about what we're sort of beginning to see in the way that viral videos and, and these attacks are shaping up is that they have to be believable enough that they connect with something that people already believed. The George Allen Makaka video caught on because there was a sense in Virginia that George Allen was a racist, that people were already predisposed to believe that that was true. And so this video, this moment that sort of caught uh, everyone by surprise when it happened, connected with something that people already believed. Let me give you an example that I think we will see at some point this year. Take a video of, uh, uh, I'll presuppose here that Barack Obama is the, the nominee. Take a video of uh, Barack Obama uh, falling off the edge of a stage or fainting at the end of a long day. I think that that's going to have very little impact on Barack Obama's campaign. The exact same video in the exact same situation with John McCain could upend John McCain's presidential run. That if people see video of John McCain being old, all of a sudden he's too old to be president. And so when what we you have to sort of think about in terms of the gotcha politics that are going to take place online is that it needs to be the, the most powerful and most devastating attacks, true or false online, are going to be the ones that most people are predisposed to believe anyway. So, next question. Yeah. Why has the Obama campaign been so successful in uh, raising so much um, online uh, A couple of reasons. First, uh, Hillary Clinton didn't need to raise the online money. She had that solid Clinton fundraising machine already in place. And I think that she is coming to realize a little late that, 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 that she should have tried to branch out beyond that. So the, the only real avenue for Barack when he got into the race was to go after the small dollar online fundraising money. Broader than that, though, it has a lot to say about, I think, um, insurgencies and uh, basically inspiration uh, and message that all of these uh, things sort of come closer to Barack's message and the way that Barack is conducting his campaign than, than they do to the way that Hillary has conducted hers, her campaign. Um, I'm going to go over here for a minute. Yeah. That's an excellent question. Um, the, so there are uh, a couple of groups that are really working on this. Uh, one is the Sunlight Foundation, um, which it, it has been doing a, uh, a campaign uh, called uh, the, the Punch Clock Campaign, where they've been trying to get uh, congressmen and senators to post each day their schedules online so that you could uh, go on there and see a historical record of what your congressperson has been doing on your behalf every single day that they've been in office. And that this is part of sort of a, a larger open source uh, government movement that we've seen that has run uh, headlong into federal government bureaucracy. Um, and what, what I mean by that is the, the federal government actually has incredibly strict rules for how they can uh, collect personal information 
and for what purposes that personal information is gathered and how securely it's stored and where it's stored and who has access to it. And so um, one, of, one of my friends in, in Washington is David Almasy, who was President Bush's uh, sort of White House webmaster, basically. It wasn't his exact title, but it was, close, it was sort of the purpose that he served. He could not, on the White House website, allow you to register so that you could sign up to, you know, get special information on, his, on, his, uh, on health care, if that was your interest, or education, if that was your interest. Because they didn't have the privacy policies and the, the data collection policies in place to allow him to do that. So I think that there's going to be a real tension going forward between how, um, how people want to interact with their government and come to expect to interact with their government uh, and the way that government is going to be able to interact back with them. Um, and, and I think an, another um, key challenge here is going to be technology like voting machines. That the way that voting machines and electronic voting and online voting will someday happen is when it's done uh, through open source. That it's done it, sort of that, that we leave the Diebold uh, model of sort of a private company in a black box creating the voting mechanisms and then assuring us all that they're really safe. Um, and, and instead, open it all up so that anyone can test it, anyone can find the flaws, anyone can suggest additions to the program to make it more secure. And that that will be when online voting and, and electronic voting can become a reality uh, on, on a broad scale. Um, you were saying already today that California is running into problems with its electronic voting machines because lo and behold, they, they may not be as entirely secure as people think that they are. So, other questions? Yeah. Yeah, you just raised one question. I'll do a second. But I have, I'm a member of a group called Project Vote Smart that's a nonpartisan nonprofit yeah, yeah. group that works real hard to collect data and do a lot of research and put it up on a massive website, be available through a 1 800 number through their website to share information on candidates and elected officials, their positions, their, their campaign finance, and all that stuff. They have something called the uh, political courage test that they've sent out to all the presidential candidates. Only one national candidate, Edwards, responded. Uh, and I'd be interested in, apparently their campaigns didn't want that information up, I don't know, for spin purposes or whatever. I'd be interested in kind of your perspective on that. So that's my first question. And secondly, knowing that Oregon and Washington are both doing mail-in ballots, why can't we all do mail-in ballots and get away from I realize technology would be great if we could all do internet voting, but obviously that's not an option for some people. Why can't we all do mail-in ballots? Uh, I think that what we have right now is, is a generational disconnect in voting technology, where the people who are currently in power, uh, of the generation currently in power, uh, believe in the the sanctity of the U.S. voting system in a way that younger generations do not. And that that's just going to be a generational shift that we're going to see o over coming elections as the generation making the decisions about how and where and when we vote changes. Um, because you, just, you have this disconnect now where the, the generation currently making the decision is sort of more in favor of paper ballots than computers. Um, and more comfortable with paper than, than with computers. And that um, the generation that is sort of coming of age in this open source Facebook world, we're much more comfortable with computers than we are with paper. Um, and that it's just going to be a process of figuring out the ways that, that, that this can uh, sort of meld one onto the other. Um, to, to, the, to the first question, I don't really know what the political courage test is, is voting on or is asking about. It's asking for stances on issues, environment, yeah. it's asking for position information. Um, I, I think that what candidates are coming to realize very quickly is that they're, that it's incredibly hard to campaign in a world where all information lives forever. Um, Mitt Romney would have done a lot better uh, this time around if no one remembered 
where he had stood on issues 10 years ago and if there wasn't video of that and if there wasn't audio of that. Um, and, and I think that to a certain extent that this is, again, a generational uh, question because, um, and we were actually talking a little bit about this over breakfast as well, that sort of the generation that's coming up, I, I, I was asking, uh, you know, what, what's going to happen to all of the photos on Facebook right now? Every photo that gets pasted to face, to, posted to Facebook is there forever and ever and ever. It will never be destroyed. And so what's going to happen 30 years from now when the generation who started posting Facebook photos in high school starts running for office and then you start having all of these Facebook albums? And there are sort of two ways to, to think about this. One is, you know, would we have ever elected George W. Bush president if we had had his Facebook albums from his years in Skull and Bones and, and at Deke at Yale? The flip side is that this could be sort of the end of gotcha politics. Paris Hilton's sex tape was amazing and a huge hit online because it was the first sex tape to really come out. Sort of every subsequent sex tape is much less interesting. <laughs> and, and that now you go online, you can, you can basically see video of any celebrity that you want having sex. And once you can do that, does it really matter that that video has come out of these people? You know, if, if we get to a point where every single person running for office has their entire life lived online, and you can go back and you can find the op-eds that they wrote for the Daily Texan about, you know, Israel-Palestine, and you found their Facebook videos from Halloween, and you have their MySpace page from high school, and that information exists for everyone, can, can you really be got on any of it? Or will people just sort of say, you know, this, this information exists for all of us, and I don't really care. Yeah, you, Lindsay. Um, what, how does this change the way that uh, candidates are dealing with the older voters? And I guess I mean like 70 plus, mm -hmm. because me and my parents kind of get used to Yeah, well, uh, so there, there are two interesting questions. Um, first is older voters are far more wired than we mostly give them credit for. Um, move on endorsed uh, Barack Obama last week. Uh, move on.org being sort of the biggest progressive online force. The average age of a move on uh, activist is well into their 40s. Um, and, you know, they, they have a very high percentage in their 50s, 60s, and, and, and older. Um, so, uh, the average blogger in the United States is in his late 40s as well. Um, so there, there are certainly, it's not as big a generational divide uh, technologically as we sometimes make it out to be. The, the other question is sort of how, how do you connect with the unwired voter, um, whether they are old or not. And that that is going to be, I think, a much bigger question. And that sort of gets to the, uh, the, the, the first half of what I was talking about in sort of what, what role does the United States have in ensuring access to, to the Internet and, and broadband and wireless technologies that they are not currently fulfilling. Um, Andrew Roche, who's a big tech entrepreneur and one of the forces behind the Sunlight and Foundation and a couple of the other movements that I talked about uh, in the book, he argues that actually the digital divide is much greater now than it was about 10 years ago. And what he means by that is that the difference between the way, like, Fortune 500 companies basically live their entire lives online now. You know, HR, email, you know, PowerPoint, et cetera, et cetera. And yet the way that we are still training most people in school um, they get exactly as much time in the computer lab today as they did 10 years ago, you know, which is one class period a day, three days a week, or, or something in that range. 
And so that this becomes a much bigger question uh, that's an education and tech infrastructure problem for the United States to address in, in the coming years. So, yeah. American um, image abroad, because not only are we getting better access to our politicians, the whole world's getting better access. Mm -hmm. And so it's been pretty well discussed that you know we're, we're losing the information war against Al Qaeda and these other you know, organizations. But is this going like, to help counter that loss? Like, are we going to start to do well in the information war abroad, or are we still going to you know keep on this horrible image and everyone hating America? Um, I think that has a lot to do with what the next president. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with who the next president is and what the uh, and, and what approach they have to to a lot of the issues that that we've been talking about um, on the democratic side, all of the candidates have promised that they will have a blogger on the White House website um, if if they're elected president um, and who knows what that will look like? the State Department's blog that they just tried for the first time um, on sort of the, the recent swing through the Middle East um, was not the most scintillating um, <laughs> piece of online commentary I have ever read, but it was definitely a step in the right direction, and it's, and it's good that people are experimenting with that. The challenge is that um, if you are the President of the United States, you already have the largest bully pulpit in the world. You know, any time that you want to, you can walk 25 feet from your office into the press briefing room, and you know, just about every network in the world will take your address live. And so, what? It, it's hard to make a case uh, in the White House that you need, you know, you need a blog and you need a weekly podcast, or you need to be doing YouTube videos. Um, but I think that I think that that's where things are going to be evolving. Other questions? Yeah. It was mentioned in the, in the your introduction that you had an important role on Congress campaign in 2004, and that you also have some insider's experience with blogging. And uh, so my question pertains to both. Uh, there's a belief out there that the Dean's campaign, partly why it, it failed, is because the campaign lost control of message and. A lot of that was related to the blogger sphere and how that evolved. So, uh, could you please comment on that statement and maybe disprove or confirm it? And uh, my second question is: Thinking to the campaign 2008, uh, how would you compare uh, how the blogger sphere is behaving towards the current uh, contenders? And um, so what's going on? Did, did the campaigns learn to manage the, mm -hmm. to control the message, or did the bloggers lose interest in just doing something else? Um, I think that the, the Dean campaign's challenge, um, and this is, this is a, a topic that I can talk about for days <laughs> on end, um, I think it was less a challenge of the campaign the, the campaign message and more a disconnect between the candidate and the campaign. That the, the campaign was, uh, uh, you know, this huge online freewheeling crazy force. Um, and the candidate was different than that. And that that was a tension in the leadership of the campaign that was never properly addressed. Uh, you know, there were there were a lot of times where uh, Joe Trippi, the campaign manager, and Howard Dean, the the candidate, were running different campaigns. Um, and I think that that was a sort of bigger issue than the the freewheeling of, of blogosphere. Um, to, to the blogosphere this time, though, I think what we have seen sort of in the blogosphere over the last four years is very similar to what we have seen in television in the last 20 years, where what used to be a, 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 a relative monolith of a couple of major blogs or a couple of major television networks has splintered into hundreds of sites and hundreds of channels and hundreds of niche communities. Um, and that as more of the 
as more communities and people turn to living their life, portions of their life online, less and less of, uh, less and less the web represents the web so much as it represents these different communities and simply them being online. So I don't think it will be possible for any candidate in this race or a future race to win the online primary in the way that Howard Dean won in 2004. Um, the, the flip side of that, though, is that it is just getting easier to do what uh, Barack Obama is doing in his online small dollar campaigning and his Facebook campaigning and his MySpace campaigning, that this is relatively low cost, incredibly high reward campaigning uh, that has the potential to... to um, to, to really transform the outcome of, of, of a race, especially on a day like today where you have these candidates pouring $20 million in television ads across 22 million states, and yet that, that is not a dent. I mean, that's not a dent in any of the television markets. I mean, that $20 million could easily be eaten up in television ads in California without, you know, without you really reaching saturation point. And so to try to spread things across a national campaign on a day like today, the only way to do that anywhere close to cost effectively is through online organizing. So along those lines here, it seems like everything we've talked about, that the online campaign is really an enabler for the older mediums. I mean, Barack Obama has all these small money donors get $30 million to do what? Buy television ads. Mm -hmm. And John Edwards is a text message to say on my website, which really says, what's the news tomorrow? But I don't want to be in New Orleans and ask my candidacy. Yep. And even with the Macaca moment, the idea isn't to put this video on YouTube to get 51% of Virginia voters to go on YouTube and see that George Allen may be racist, but is there enough interest to get on Oberman or Matthews or whatever? Yep. So if it, if, since the internet is so low cost and high reward, when does it become the medium itself? And what does it take to get there? Is it just generational? Is there some sort of policy that could get us to that point where we don't have to spend hundreds of million dollars on television ads to get someone elected, but we go to the medium that is more accessible? Yeah, uh, I, I think that sort of everything that you said will just play a factor in getting there, that um, it's a little bit policy driven. We need to do more to get people online. Um, it, it's a little bit sort of message driven and that candidates need to get better about understanding how powerful this medium can be and directing people to that. Um, and that that will be sort of an election by election thing where the people who started off as the, um, you know, the, the, the junior web staff in Dean in 04 or Obama 08 end up, the, you know, as the candidates themselves in 2016 or whatever. Um, and, and then I also think, um, you know, I think that it, right now the Internet is an incredibly low-cost, fantastic message and uh, vehicle, but that it's quite possible that by the time it really catches up to, say, television, it will be just as expensive as, as television is today. Um, we're not, you know, ad, ad rates are going up online uh, data rates are, are data costs are going up uh, very quickly with broadband intensive things like video and, and podcasts and, uh, and HD uh, videos even more. And so I think that um, I don't necessarily see that politics online will be any cheaper than politics is today offline. But I think what will be the major funding change is, uh, is the way that it is funded. Um, in 1984, Gary Hart upset uh, Walter Mondale in the New Hampshire primary, but basically had to drop out because he couldn't get money in fast enough. That the, the lag time in 1984 from sort of having something happen to getting the money in your bank account was about three weeks. Because you needed to send out a letter, you needed that letter to arrive, you needed someone to write a check, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, take it down to the post office, mail it back to you. You needed to open the envelope, collect the checks, count the checks, deposit the checks, get the checks to clear, 
and all of a sudden, you know, three weeks later, you'd have the money. And that, that in 1984 was just too long of a process for, for Gary Hart to stay in the race. Today, if Barack Obama has, uh, you know, a giant win in, uh, you know, California or, or elsewhere tonight, um, you know, it's possible he wakes up tomorrow morning with $5 million in online donations. Uh, that is money he didn't have tonight and yet has tomorrow to spend. So you could be an insurgent candidate going into a primary day and be absolutely dead broke at the end of the primary day and wake up the next morning and have a million, two million, ten million dollars in, in, in your bank account. Okay. Yeah. Um, open. Well, what are the implications for news coverage in general and political journalism in particular? Sure. In the future, is everybody going to be a reporter for 15 minutes or is this a mainstream media going to be able to capitalize on all that? Yeah, the, this is actually the subject of the course that I teach at Georgetown. So I, I will give you a 12-week uh, course boiled down to about a one-minute answer. I think that the challenge of this medium is that the web makes it incredibly easy to self-select the news coverage that you're looking to find. If you, 10 years ago, were watching the evening news or you were reading the morning newspaper, you would be confronted with news that you didn't necessarily want to hear and that didn't necessarily comport with your pre-existing beliefs. The challenge, especially in, in blogging communities, is that you can, you can get your news today only from sites whose viewpoints you already agree with. So if you think that the Bush administration is the worst thing that has ever happened in human history, there are websites online that will filter every single thing that happens anywhere in the world through that prism. And you can only get your news directly from them. If, on the other hand, you want to get, uh, you, you think that the Bush administration is the greatest thing that has ever happened to, to, to the United States and that Bush should be up on Mount Rushmore, there are certainly websites that you can go to that will filter all of the news specifically through that, through that juncture. Um, and that I think that this is a big problem for public policy and debate because um, Jim Fallows, uh, who's an editor at The Atlantic, uh, says that the challenge that we have is that our generation no longer has agreeable truths that an important part of public policy and public debate is that you have to have a starting point that you agree on. Is Social Security going to go bankrupt in 2020 or 2040? I need to, I need to answer that question before I can go about solving the question of Social Security. Does Iraq have weapons of mass destruction? I need to solve that question before I can figure out whether I need to invade Iraq to deal with their weapons of mass destruction. And that if we no longer have agreeable truths and we no longer have starting points for public discourse and public debate that this is going to be a huge problem for our generation going forward um, and I think that that's what makes the work that journalists um, and PR people um, and, and schools like LBJ so important in this new environment is that it's really going to be up to us to figure out the ways in, in the next decade to ensure that people are getting the news that they need to get and getting the information that they need to get in order to be informed citizens in the digital world. So. I think on that note, yeah. um, that is, we're out of time for questions, but uh, I did want to thank Garrett Graff for coming by. His book is The First Campaign. And uh, so thank you so much for all of your comments. Yeah.